Amen, amen. One of the funny things that, that one of the funny things that people remember is that we call people that have been incarcerated to pray over people. Because I mean, Don Miller and Doug Clay were like have have told that story and they're like, I I've, I've never seen so many people come down that have been incarcerated in a church. Come on. So it's exciting, man. God is good. God, and all the t- and all the time. Who do we serve? And what do we do? I said, who do we serve? And what do we do? Come on, come on. You know what? I'm I'm blessed today. We got we got uh, Pastor Barry and Misty and Branson in the house. Let's give them a big hand. Come on. God is good. We're excited. This is their family. Barry, we're glad to have you here. So ba- ba- Pastor Barry and, and the Branson team for Easter is going to come, and they're going to run our overflow room for Easter because we know we're gonna, this place is going to be packed out on Easter. So they're going to run our overflow room. So this is family. You know what I mean? Barry and Misty, stand up. You know, and let's just give them a bit. Misty likes it when we do this. Come on. Come on. God bless you. Thank you, God. Come on. So I want to I give away a couple books this morning. My, it's my story. My prison became a palace. So if you cannot afford one, come on. Oh, shoot. People put their hands down. Who cannot afford? How about someone from a recovery home? From, okay, one of you girls come up here. Whoever gets up here first. Zach, you want to help me here? Who... Who, who else wants, you want one right there? That, that girl right there, we got two more. Who else wants one? Are you guys in a recovery home now? All right, give one to heaven. He, heaven gets one. He, heaven gets one. Who else? Are you guys in a, rec- okay, there you go. All right, I'm, so, and here, so here's the thing. We got lots of requests for uh, more books. So if you can afford to buy one, buy one so we can help get them into prisons. And also if you can afford to buy 10 or 20 you know what I mean? Buy them so that we can get them in into prisons and jails. We have requests coming in every, every, every day, you know what I mean, of prisons asking for us to donate the books. And I'm like, I'll give you five or ten, you know what I mean? We got the prison we were just at, they asked for 150 books, you know. So, and then, and then you know what, the, the thing of it is, is we just sent, I think I told you guys this before, but we sent a bunch to an attorney in Dallas, Fort Worth, that wants to get them into all the, all the jails in Dallas, Fort Worth, and the Metroplex, be, because she actually, one of her clients, actually it was Susan Smith's friend, picked up a book at Anita's wedding, took it back down there, gave it to her friend who gave it to her son who's in the jail. He had a radical encounter with Jesus Christ. You know what I mean? And so then the attorney's like, this guy's life's changed. We need to get this book into every, every jail, you know what I mean, and the Metroplex. And so pretty amazing. I don't even know if the attorney is saved. Is the attorney a Christian? You don't know either. Okay. If not, she is now, hopefully, by reading that book. And so, you know what? We, uh, 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 we're doing a segment called Be- Beyond the Walls. You know what I mean? So if you see some camera guys, if you, here, here we got Brian Lippert. Give Brian Lippert a big hand right here. <laughs> Matt Smith in the back right there. Give them a big hand. Give him a big hand. So we're glad to have them with us. How many know we are a church that goes beyond the walls of our local church? Come on. You know, and, 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 and they came down here. They got, it was supernatural that we got accepted. We got allowed to take the camera team into Eastern Correctional Center. So they had the chaplain there. I know him. He's the one that asked me to actually start going into that prison. But he's like, I just want to let you know that this is not going to happen. You know what I mean? I said, brother, I'm praying for favor. I'm expecting you to help do everything you can to help us get in there. And we actually got it approved from the top of DOC just two weeks ago. You know what I mean? We got it approved from the top of DOC to the wardens at two facilities to let us go in. So it's amazing. It's a, it's, I mean, it's a miracle that they let us in. 
The one in the one in uh, uh, the one we were just at, they said that they don't actually they, that he's been there 30 years and they only let it happen twice and they haven't done it in 10 years because last time there was a riot afterwards. So, uh, but I, we 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 are there Friday night, Saturday morning. So my voice is go, my pray for me that my voice can make it through this morning, and then we're going to be back out at a, at the prison in Fordland tonight. But man, God is on the move. You know that first service we had about 120 men show up. You know what I mean? More than 60 men came forward and answered the altar call. Come on. And, and then last year when I was there, because uh, uh, some of y'all know God spoke to me about an army that he's raising up out of the prisons of the United States of America. That, oh, we're still doing this? That will go across this land. I love it. Let's keep that. Huh? That's for the books for the prison. Books for the prison. All right. Yeah. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Ray Ray came out, Ray Ray came out of prison ministry. So two years ago when I was speaking at, e, at, e, at uh, South Central Correctional Center, the prison and, and, and licking the supermax, you know what I mean? That's where Ray Ray had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And then Ray Ray, come on, come on. Come on. Come on. Yeah. We're, we're a church that loves inmates. We love convicts. Come on, somebody. We love prostitutes. We love the homeless. We love crackheads. We love heroin addicts. Come on. Come on. Come on. We love meth cooks. Come on. We love the down and out. Come on. We love tax collectors. We love sinners. Come on. God is on the move this morning. Come on. That's what I'm talking about this morning. So it's exciting. You know, Ray, Ray, Ray met the Lord there, went to Eastern Correctional Center, and then told the, and the chaplain there was like, this guy's life's transformed. What happened? And he goes, this pastor came at Licking, did a revival. And then so then that, the chaplain actually contacted me to say, hey, whatever you did in Licking, can you come do that over here? <laughs> And so, and so when I was trying to get the camera team in, I reminded him of that. Uh, I, uh, chaplain, remember, you asked me to come over here, so help me out here. Counting on you, brother. Yeah. Come on. And so, uh, but God's on the move, and then also we hit the streets yesterday. How many were in the streets with us yesterday? We were, come on, look at this. How many are here today because you were invited yesterday on the streets? Anybody here? Oh, well. One, two, three, four. Come on, five. Five, this guy over here. Come on. We're a church, we're a church that likes to go beyond the walls. Come on, somebody. And so watch, and so, and you know what? Watch this. How many, how many would say that at this church is where you encountered God? You know what I mean? We're saved, answered the altar call, or even baptized in water. Raise your hands from all over. Raise your Get it, Matthew, leave your hands up. Leave, if, you, if you say this is the church where you met the Lord or baptized, raise your hand. Matthew, I want you to get a picture of this. I want you to turn it this way. This, look at how many hands are going up that they encountered God at this church. Come on. You know why? Come on, somebody. Because we are a church that believes on going beyond the walls. That we're a church that believes in getting outside the four walls of our church. We're not a church that's trying to get people to come over from another church to come join our church. We're going out and we're reaching the one far from God in our community. Come on. Come on, somebody. 
God is good. Amen. Come on, come on, show me steak, she said. We're in the show me steak. Uh, so, hey, uh, so right now, you know, today I, I want to talk about a very important message. As, as we get here, I want to I want to get through this. But today, I want to talk about I want to talk about mind games. Tap your neighbor and say mind games. The Bible says we're not we're not ignorant of the devil's schemes. How many know the devil likes to play mind games? And that's all he does. And so you know what? Baby elephants, you guys have heard this before, but this is the, if you can get a hold of this teaching, this will help you live a successful Christian walk. If you can get a hold and understand this teaching right here. So here, here, here's the thing. You know, baby elephants, you know what I mean? When, 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 they're, when they're babies, they're actually, they're, they'll be tied to a post with a rope or a chain, a little tiny baby elephant's tied, right? And what happens is that little baby elephant tries to break free. He tries to break free day after day, all, all that he can. But you know what happens is he's unable to break free because he's a little baby elephant. But you know what? When he gets up and he grows up and he becomes an old, old elephant, largest living land animal, you know what I mean? 7,000 pounds, huh? The weight of three to four Cadillac Escalades. You know what I mean? And he tries, come on, he tries to break free. Guess what? He can't. Why? Why can't he break free? He lost his faith. Come on. You know what? He can't because, because his experiences as a child have convinced him that he can't break it. His past experiences in his life have convinced him that nothing's going to change, that everything is going to stay the same. And some of us in this room this morning have been uh, convinced by our past experiences that nothing will ever change in our lives. Many in this room, the devil has kept us captive through lies and deception that you will never break free. You know, uh, uh, but I got good news this morning. The Bible says that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. The Bible says, do you know what I mean? If any man or woman be in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Come on, somebody. Come on. The enemy, you know, uh, has placed the thought in some of our minds that things will never change. They'll continue to be the way they always have been. My, my mama was an addict. My, my daddy was an addict. My mom went to prison. You know what I mean? My, my parents were in poverty. You know what I mean? It's nothing is ever going to change in my life. Look, at one time in my life, I thought I would die a heroin addict. I thought I would die overdosed or I thought that I, or I thought I would die in prison or I thought I would die by getting shot. Like, like, like 16 of, of my closest friends, you know what I mean, that, that have been killed, that have, have died. You know what I mean? I thought that, that was my end and I, have, I had given up, you know what I mean, to, to that life. That that's the way it was going to be. You know what? I, there was even a time in my life when I didn't think I would make it past age 25. Can you believe it? I'm 23 years old. My friends are dropping like, fr like flies, and, and I think there's no way I can make it to 25. Making it to 25 in, in the circle that I was running with, that was like, you was old. You made it. You was an OG if you made it to 25 without doing, getting, getting locked up or dead. That, that was, you were doing big things if you made it to 25. You know what I'm talking about, Gus? And so, but you know what, uh, 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 but, but the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, they are a new creation. And so stand with me this morning as we read this text, uh, 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3, and it reads like this. It says, but I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds, everybody say your mind, your mind. may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you today. And God, Lord, we pray that you would have your way in this house today as you already have. God, Lord, we pray that strongholds would be broken in the mighty name of Jesus. We recognize that the weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of this world. But on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension and every thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient 
obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I command, I command Satan and his minions to loosen their hold in this house today. You have no authority in this house and over God's people. We bind the strong man right now in Jesus' name. We loosen a spirit of liberty. Uh, we loosen freedom in this house today. And we point to you, Lord Jesus. You said if you be exalted, you would draw all men and women unto you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Tap your neighbor and say, don't be playing mind games with me. <laughs> so Paul right here, Paul, Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. Right, And what he is saying right here is that he fears that the same way that the devil had, 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 you know, had, had deceived Eve in the garden, that he was doing the same thing in the church in Corinth, right? And, and, and so you know what? When the devil bombards your mind with his thoughts so long that finally you believe that they're, they're your thoughts, that's what the Bible calls a stronghold. That we got strongholds in our mind. And, and, and not everything that comes into our mind do we got to agree with. We got to take it captive and we got to ca cast it down. So watch this. According to Paul, the same snake that deceived Eve 2,000 years ago is doing the same thing here. So when did that happen in Genesis? Well, let's look at it real quick. Genesis 3, 1 through 6. It goes like this. Now the serpent was more crafty. Everybody say mo crafty. Than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, no, we may, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat free from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. You like, to, watch this, this is a different message, but right here, Eve says, we can't, you can't eat of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and then she added to what God said and said, you must not touch it. That's the beginning of legalism, right? They want to add to the word of God. But anyway, that's a whole different message. Tim could probably take it, take, take it a lot further than that in the discipleship class, but that's, that went further than what God would said. So anyway, that's a whole, I could... I'm just going to keep going. You will, you, will certain, you will not certainly die. You know, kind of like the people that came against us for saying, welcome junk, junkies, sinners, and saints, or felons, junkies, and saints, that kind of people. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God. Everybody say, like God. Like God. Knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and, and, also des and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some of it and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. So that's interesting. So what does, and I, and I shared, I, I, just, I, I really felt like I should share this message. I shared this in the prison uh, uh, this, 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 this weekend too, but I really feel like this is a word of God for many of us. And so what does crafty mean? Sneaky, deceiving, skilled in underhandedness. How many used to be skilled in underhandedness? In <laughs> some of y'all some of y'all weren't 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 you you were underhanded, you just weren't skilled at it. Yeah, come on somebody. <laughs> you just wasn't a very good criminal. So so watch this. So, so, back, so back in the old, I'm going to try to bring this home. Remember, I use, I use examples that are, you know what I mean, from my life. So you just, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, that, so anyway, I use examples from my own life. So if that doesn't apply to you guys this morning, just, you know, contextualize it to your own uh, context. But, uh, but so the thing of it is, is, you know, uh, I used to be a little bit crafty, Jason. You know, I, I was crafty back in the day, Gus. You know, uh, I, I, you know, we used to do, you know, when I was a heroin addict, man. When we needed money to get our heroin, we would do, do whatever it took. 
Come on, come on, Bradley. You hear, you hear me back there? So we did whatever it took when we needed to get our hair on. Come on. And so what, what, hap- what, what happened was, man, I, we, there used to be this street called Yale Avenue in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And on, on, Yale, a- on Yale Avenue was where people would come pick up their drugs on the street. You know what I mean? They would come and, and, and they cop dope right there on the street. They would stop and they would, you know, pick up dope and go. And so, uh, so when, we needed, when we needed, you know what I mean, to, to come up, you know what I mean? What we would do is we would go out there, we would chop up, you know what, we would get the, the, the ivory soap and chop it, chop it, I'm talking big old fat rocks. You know what I mean? Fat rocks, wrap it up in saran wrap because it looks like rock cocaine, y'all. For the, but so then, then we, and then we would wrap it up and then we would go out, we would go out and start selling, selling the, the, the rock. You know what I mean? And, 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 if, and if they tried to question it, we'd be like, You know, if they'd be like, let me just, man, give me that back. The cops are coming. Man, get out of here. What's the matter with you (laughs) trying to get me busted? You know what I mean? And and I mean, we was hooking people up, Emmanuel. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? 10 for 80. You know what I mean? Doing better than dubs with people. But but anyway, you know, that's crafty, getting over on people. You know what I mean? And you just hope you didn't see those people again. You know what I mean? See them drive off, pull into the gas station. Next thing, they're opening the door and spitting something out. You know what I mean? And you don't have to worry about seeing them again until you're in the county jail and you end up in the same cell. <clears throat> Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Or you know what, how about this? Have you ever, you ever had any, anyone, you know, when you need money and you're like, hey, bro, you know what? Hey, just give me the money. I'll be right back. I'll be right I prom- I promise I'm not going to take your money. I just can't take you to dude's house. He's got Rottweilers. He's, got, he's, he's tweaking out. He'll shoot you. You know what I mean? So I'm going to hook you up. You give, bro, I'm not going to take your money. I won't steal it. Just give me the money. I'll be right back. Ghost, come on. That's crafty. That's get. That's getting over on um, people, and that's what. That's what. Get this. This is what Paul is saying that the devil is doing to some of us. None of us like to get gotten over on and taken advantage of and used and abused, but this is actually what Paul is saying the devil has been doing to the church at Corinth. This is what the devil has been doing since the beginning. You know what I mean? He's been getting over on us, and so Paul wants to be very, very clear right here on how not to have that happen. And so watch this. Let's look just from this passage that we just read. You know what I mean? We see that the first thing the devil does is he says, did God really say, huh? Did God really say? The first thing the devil does is he puts doubt in our minds. He begins to make us question what God said. Is that really what the Bible says? Did God really say, you know what I mean? You shouldn't have sex before marriage. Did God, did God really say this or did God really say that? He puts doubt in our mind, right, as to the what clearly is the word of God. Verse 2 and 3, we see that God only gave them one commandment. He didn't give them a whole bunch of commandments. He gave them one commandment. You know what I mean? And they couldn't even do that. But here's, and I think that they weren't even thinking about going and eating of that fruit until the enemy came in and tempted them, and then they succumbed to the temptation you know, and so there was only one thing they couldn't do, not a whole bunch of things, only one thing. And then in verse 4, the first the enemy brings doubt, and then in verse 4, we see that he contradicts the word of God. He said, God did not really say that. He contradicts, straight up contradicts the word of God, and he begins to tell Eve, God's holding out on you. You can be like God. God don't want you to be like him. That's why he doesn't want you to eat of that fruit. God doesn't have your best interest at heart. God, God, wants, he, God is holding out, on, holding out on you, right? You, you don't need God. You can be your own God. You can be your own shot caller. You can call the shots. You can do whatever you want. You don't need him telling you what to do. And God is, and the enemy is doing the same thing with us today. You know, there, there is the, you know, what, what is the, 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 the book of Satan, the, the Bible of Satan? You know, it's in the, get the, get the, uh, get my article, Pharmakia, on your way out if you can. But, but it talks about how, you know, even the book of Satan says, do what thou wilt. Do whatever you want. You know what I mean? So from the very beginning, 
That's what the devil has been saying. Do what you want. You know what I mean? And so, but God wants your best. God created you. He knows how you should operate. You know what I mean? He's got the, he's got the handbook. He's got the manual. So you need to follow the way that God, you know, created you to live, and then you'll be truly happy. What the devil tries to come in is to get you to sin and do this and do that, trying to say you'll be happy. But how many know when you go the devil's way, you go that way long enough, you're not going to be happy. You're not going to have peace. You're not going to have joy. And eventually what the devil wants to do is to get you to take your life. That's the end game of the devil. Because he comes to steal, he comes to kill, and he comes to destroy. So Satan is doing the same thing today. I can't stop doing drugs. Well, well, who said that? I, I I can't get my children back. I can't be a godly woman. I can't be a godly man. huh? I can't control my temper. Well, who said that? You know, you say it's your idea, you know what I mean, because you know that you can't, but it's not your idea, you know, by origination. It's your idea by adoption. You have adopted the thoughts of the devil, and you have made them your own, which is a stronghold in your life. Come on. God would never give you the idea that you have to be an addict the rest of your life. God would never give you the idea that you got to be defeated. Come on. God would never give you the idea that your marriage would never work. God would never give you the idea that you can't get your children back. Come on. God would never give you the idea that you got to be depressed the rest of your life. God would never give you the idea that you got to take a handful of pills in the morning and a handful of pills at night just to go to bed. God would never give you that idea. Come on, somebody. When the devil takes his idea and you make it your idea, that is what the Bible calls a stronghold. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, it says, For though before we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons that we fight with are not the weapons of this world, but on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension, huh? every argument, every thought that exhausts itself against the knowledge of Christ. And we take captive those thoughts to make them obedient to the Lord Jesus Christ. The battle is right here. If if our thoughts are not God's thoughts, we need to cast them down. You say, I can't get those thoughts off my mind. Well, they're, they're not your thoughts. They're the devil's thoughts. They're not your thoughts by origination. They are your thoughts by adoption. You have adopted the devil's lies, and that's how the enemy keeps you captive. The devil is crafty. He's, he's skilled in underhandedness. When you adopt his thoughts, he got you captive. He got you locked up. Now you're his, but you can break free this morning. Once Satan had her mind, he got her emotions, pleasing, delightful, desirable. These all have to do with emotions. She looked at the fruit, desirable, you know what I mean, pleasing to the eye, you know, desirable for making one wise, you know what I mean? So she went and she, and she took of it, but this all has to do with feelings, huh? How many have ever said, I, I don't feel like I can make it? I, I don't feel like I can go on anymore. I don't feel like I can sit through an hour of preaching. Come on, somebody. I, 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 don't, I don't feel like I can go on anymore. Huh? I don't feel happy this morning. Huh? I don't feel like I can change. Huh? I don't feel like I can control, control my temper. I, don't, I feel like I'll always be an addict the rest of my life. The only reason, watch this, the only reason you feel that way is because you think that way. Your feelings are always tied to your thoughts. If the devil can get your mind, he will get your emotions, and then it's hard to shake because you say, well, that's just what I feel. That's what I think. That's what I know. You know what I mean? But it's not the reality. It's not reality. It's just that you have adopted Satan's ideas. You have adopted his thoughts, and you have made them your own. I feel like I got to get a shot in my arm. Come on. I feel like I got to get a puff off of a bubble. I feel like I got to roll a blunt or, or get me some Hennessy. I, I feel like I got to go down to the Brown Derby. Come on. I feel like killing this guy. I feel like leaving the hope home. I feel like, I feel like so-and-so at church don't like me. 
Did you see the way she was looking at my outfit? I'm not going back to that church anymore. The pastor didn't say hi to me after service. I feel like he don't like me. I'm not going back to church no more. These feelings are real, but they're based on the devil's thoughts. Come on. God would never give you that idea. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12 says, finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Everybody say devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Come on. Come on. Mind games. Your mind is the target of the enemy. If the devil can get you to believe one wrong thought about yourself, he will get you captive. And the only reason that you feel a certain way is because you think a certain way. Bible has a lot to say about emotions, and, and we're, we're wrapping up. For, we're going to be wrapping up here shortly. But I want to look at a few verses that talk about the devil attacking our minds. Huh? We always want to go back to the Word of God. Huh? We, we, we don't want to. We don't want to base what we believe on on what on what what your homie or homegirl, you know what I mean, that lives next door said. We want to base what we believe clear on the clear teaching of Scripture. Second Corinthians four three and four says this. And even if our gospel is hidden, and even if our gospel is hidden, it is veiled to those who are perishing, to those who are without Jesus. Watch this. The God of this age has blinded the minds. Everybody say blinded the minds. minds. Of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Watch this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, give your request to God, and the peace of God that transcends knowledge and understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. Everybody say minds. In Christ Jesus. Isaiah 55, 9 says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. As high as the heavens, as far as higher than the heavens, so are my thoughts from your thoughts and my ways from your ways. Come on, somebody. And, and so in that, that scripture, 2, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, when it talks about pretensions, right? Pretensions is an argument or an attempt to make something that is false seem true. That's what the devil does. He, 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 he gives pretensions. That's why we take pretensions captives. He tries to get us to see that something that is false seem true. Who we are in Christ. What we're able to do. God has created you to rule and reign in life. He's given you everything that you need for life and for godliness. You know what I mean? We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us. We are the head and not the tail. Come on, somebody. We are the head and not the tail. We are victors. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. The only way the devil's got us tricked is he's got us believing otherwise. He's got us believing that we are beaten because we've adopted his lies. Come on, somebody. Come on, tell it, somebody. Once you believe the lies in the enemy of the enemy and you start proclaiming them, that's when the enemy's got you captive, right? Because the devil is a liar. He's the father of lies, Jesus said. He's been lying since the beginning. Jesus says when he lies, he speaks his native tongue, right? But when we, when we begin to tell our, ourselves what the devil has told us, you know what I mean? That's how the devil keeps us captive because there's life and death is in the tongue. So when we begin to proclaim the things that the devil has told us, huh, we begin to, there's power in agreement. You got to be careful who you agree with. If you, if you begin to agree, if you begin to agree with the devil, you know what I mean? That gives, that gives power to the enemy. But when you get into God's word and you begin to agree with God's word, that's when you got power and you got victory. Come on. 
That's, that's the truth. So what the, what the devil does is he bombards our minds with cleverly devised pattern of little nagging thoughts and suspicions and doubts and fears and reasonings, right? He begins to tell you God don't really love you. If God loves you, why did this or that happen to you? You know what I mean? He begins to tell you you don't need God. You can be your own God. He begins to tell you, look at everything that's happened to you. Life is hopeless. You will never be happy, but these are strongholds, and it gets us held in a prison. But the Bible says, Jesus says, I, you know, I, the, I, the anointing is upon me to preach good news to the poor. The release, you know what I mean, of the captives, huh? The opening of the prison door to the prisoners to heal the brokenhearted, you know? And so the Bible says, as a man or woman thinks in his heart, so is he. What you, what you think about yourself will begin to bear fruit in your life. That's why these hope homes are so important. You know what I mean? When you look at the hope homes, don't, don't feel sorry for them. You should envy them because they get to be in a place where they hear the word of God every day. And God's raising up soldiers in these hope homes. Come on. If you go through the hope home, that's like going to church for like seven years. Faithfully. I'm serious. You get more work. It'll take seven years for a regular congregant to get what they get in a hope home. Amen. Power and death is in the life of the tongue. So, Zach, can you put this back up here? And so, uh, 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 if you think you'll never break free from addiction, you need to quote the word of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. If you're feeling worthless, come on. If you're feeling worthless, Psalm 139, 14 says, I praise you, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I know that your works are wonderful, and I know that full well. If you're wanting to give up because of trials and because of tribulations, you can just quote Philippians 4 and 13, which says, I can do all things through Jesus. Come on. You guys knew that one. If you're feeling defeated by the enemy, you can quote 1 John 4, 4, which says you dear children are from God and you have overcome them because the one that is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Come on. If the enemy begins to attack you, you can quote Luke 10, 19, and you can say, no, 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 because Jesus said, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means harm you. Come on. I feel like I'm in church today with some folk that have been set free by the power of God. Psalms 118, 17, when you're feeling depression or you're feeling suicidal, which we often have people come in here that were going to leave and kill themselves, but by the power and presence of God, they didn't. So if you're feeling suicidal, you just get an index card and you write down Psalm 118, 17, and you say, I shall not die, but live and declare the praises of God. Y'all... And y'all, I don't have time to go through all the different examples of this in Scripture, but if we just look at Matthew 13, 2, it says that Satan put it in Judas' heart to betray Jesus. It says that Satan put it in Judas' heart to betray Jesus. Other translations say Satan suggested to Judas. Other translations says Satan put, it, put the thought in his mind. The King James Version don't play. They just say Satan entered Judas. Come on. Yeah, so, so you, the, you know, they say this, you, can keep, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you, but, but you can't keep them from making a nest in your hair. Come on. So the thoughts will come, but that don't mean you have to let them nest. Come on, somebody. It's, it's that second look. Come on. It's that second look. Come on. We want to take captive every thought. We want to replace the enemy's thoughts with God's thoughts. 
Get God's thoughts in your mind and in your heart. Listen to the, listen to the, we got the YouTube channel. If you miss a service, listen to it. Listen to it again. Get the audio Bible. You know what I mean? Begin to read your word. Begin to listen to solid podcasts. You know what I mean? Sometimes I go back and listen to my own messages. I really do. I go back and listen to them and it ministers to me. You know what I mean? Sometimes I need to hear what I know. I know it, but sometimes I need to hear it again. Come on, somebody. Sometimes I get discouraged, but I got I to gotta just tell the devil, you know, that I will rejoice in the Lord. You know what I mean? And I just got to glorify God even when I don't feel it. Even when you don't feel it, because it's not a walk of feelings, it's a walk of faith. I, you know, not, not every Sunday when I come to church, and it's been a long night, Come on, we're dealing with hope homes, with church plants. Sometimes when I get to church and it's been a chaotic day, chaotic night and day, sometimes chaotic weeks and sometimes chaotic months. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Sometimes I get to church and I don't feel it. But guess what? That's too bad. Come on, that's too bad. I put a smile on my face. I began to clap. I get up here and I began to preach the gospel until the anointing of God falls upon me. Because you know what? It's not a walk of feelings. It's a walk of faith. Matthew 16, 22 and 23, it's interesting because Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Right? And he said, never, Lord, this won't happen to you. Right? This will never happen. Right? And so come here, come here. So let's pretend Zach's Jesus. Come here. And then Peter walks in and is like, come here, homie. Look, don't be talking about all that, all this cross stuff. That's not going to happen. I got you back. All right? So I want you to shh, shh, shh. I don't want you talking like that no more, Jesus. All right, now go ahead and sit down. He pulls Jesus aside, tells him, you're not going to the cross. We got your back. We got some swords. You remember that? He goes, how many swords should we take? Jesus is like, take one. He's like, we got two. Jesus is like, that's enough. You know what I mean? So it's not about, because it's not, battle is not physical. The, battle, our, the weapons that we fight with are not carnal. But then Jesus turned to see Peter and said what? Get thee behind me, Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. That's what he said. So he began, to, he addressed the source of that statement. See, the source of that statement was satanic. And Jesus addressed the source of it because if Jesus didn't go to the cross and die, we would be condemned to hell. So he didn't have, Peter didn't have in the mind of the things of God. But Peter didn't like, he didn't like say, he didn't like be like, Satan, tell me something cool to say to Jesus. No, no. What happened was Satan came in and disguised his thoughts as Peter's thoughts. If Peter's walking along and you know what I mean, and, and, and Satan whispers to him, hey, why don't you sell out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver? And then he's walking along and he's like, I got it. Why don't I sell out Jesus for some easy money? You know what I mean? I could go clubbing with the Pharisees tonight. You know what I mean? And, and so, and then, and then so he, so, so, but that wasn't his idea by origination. That was his idea by adoption. Satan came in and disguised his thoughts as Peter's thoughts. See, Satan wants to give us his idea, and then we believe it's our idea. So this is the preaching statement. Satan Satan gives you his thoughts in your mind until you believe they're your thoughts, and then he gets your emotions, he gets your feelings, and then he gets you doing things his way, the devil's way instead of God's way. Buying into Satan's lies can have eternal consequences. We need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds so that we can test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will, according to Romans 12, 2. In John 8, 31 through 32, Jesus said, if you hold to my teachings, if you hold fast to my teachings and obey them, live in accordance with them, you really are my disciples. Then, if you hear the truth and you live by it, then... You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. huh? So you have to know the truth first. So we get people that come into the Hope Home that are struggling with all kinds of stuff, and they're like, I've been here 12 hours. Why ain't I free yet? And it's like, well, you're expecting God to, you know what I mean? How, how long did it take you to get to where you at? How long did it take you? How many years? 
You know what I mean? So now it's a process of going out. That's why nine months in the Hope Home is key. That's why 30 days or a three-day weekend rehab might not work. Maybe it does for some people. Some people it does. You know what I mean? And, that, and that's fine. You know what I mean? I know like Michelle did a 30-day, th- where's Michelle Bordeaux at? Michelle did 30 days, but she was watching the, the church for six months before that. God was speaking to her. You know what I mean? And now she's on fire for God, ain't you, Michelle? <laughs> Romans 8, 5 and 8 for says, for those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh. Everybody say set, set their minds. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. For, the, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. So there's power in agreement. We want to agree with the Word of God. We don't want to agree with what the world says. As the worship team comes up this morning, we don't want to agree. The world says once an addict, always an addict. But the Word says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. Come on. The world, the world says that we came out of some primordial soup and we grew from fish to monkeys to people. But my Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Come on, somebody. The Bible said that the world says make money, start more businesses, got to get yours. But the Bible says store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust kind of do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Come on. The, Bible, the world says put yourself first, huh? but the word of God says the first will be last. Come on. You know what I mean? The, the world says get revenge. Get back with them for what they did to you. But the Bible says turn the other cheek. The world Many times the world and the word are directly opposite to each other. Let us agree with the word, not the world. So as the worship team begins to, begins to worship this morning, you know, uh, many of us, you know, sometimes we find ourselves like a hamster. You know, you have a little hamster and he's running in a cage. Let's go ahead and dim those lights. We got a little hamster running in a cage and he can see outside. The little, the little aquarium, right? He can see outside. He can see freedom. And he gets in that little cage on that little wheel, and he begins to run. I got to get freedom. I got to get free. If I can just go faster. I'm not even going to stop and eat. I'm just going to keep going faster because I see freedom right there. But let me tell you something. That little hamster can try all he wants until someone greater than him reaches in, lifts him up, and sets him free. Until you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you're just spinning your wheels. You're not going nowhere. Until Jesus' life, get, Jesus gets in your life, you're going to keep living the same way you've always lived. But I got good news for you today that the Bible says the reason the Son of God was manifested was to destroy the works of the devil. And so this, this altar call is going to be twofold. We're going to, we want to pray for people to be set free from strongholds in your mind and for you to, you to surrender, to, surrender your, your thought life to God. It's so important. This is a battle. If anyone told you come to Jesus and it'll be easy, they lied to you. I'm sorry. It's not easy. The Bible says work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The Bible says fight the good fight of faith. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be worth it. And God's going to be with you every step of the way. And, there, and there's really no other option. God wants to meet some people today. And I don't know where you're at. The, I don't know where you're at this morning. Shoot, we got a C note down here. Come on. Years ago, many of you have heard my story. But listen, years ago, In 1998, on the run for attempted murder, I walked into a little rehab, you know what I mean, in in, in Phoenix, Arizona, by the name of Victory Outreach. And I walked into that rehab. My idea was not to get off, not to get, not to, to find Jesus. I just wanted to get off the heroin so I could stay on the run and keep living my life for me. But you know what? I went into that little recovery home, and what ended up happening is, man, the, the, the God of the universe got a hold of my life. Man, the same Jesus I had heard about when I was a little kid, man, this was real. He got a hold of my life. He wrecked my life. 
And, I, and I, my, my worldview changed overnight. I didn't want drugs no more. I didn't want to be the man I used to be, not because I was afraid of the law, because I wasn't, because I feared God. I had a higher morality. I didn't want to offend the God that had met me so dearly in that little recovery home. But listen, so, so I graduated the recovery home, then I ran the recovery home, and then I went to the school of ministry in downtown Los Angeles, and right there, man, we continued to, I continued to learn, I continued to, uh, we continued to hit everybody oh, in L.A., and, and, and man, God was on the move. And then I graduated that recovery, uh, the, the school of ministry, and they asked me to go to the, to the Philippines to, 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 to plant churches, to be a missionary. You know what I mean? And, and I, had, I said, I have an open account of attempted murder. But they said, go ahead and, go ahead and try it. You know what I mean? A, a, a pastor actually came up to me and he goes, he goes, look, when I came to Jesus, I had a stack of charges like that, eh? But Jesus whoosh, made all the charges disappear. And so I said, well, I claim that for me. Come on. It didn't work out that way. But anyway, you know, but I ended up flying out on my own passport to Manila. God moved in the Philippines. We saw people set free, delivered, planted churches, started recovery homes. God's favor was upon our lives. And then I came back to, I came back to, 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 to LAX and I flew in and I was arrested on those old charges huh, from before I met the Lord. And you know, how many know that Jesus forgives? How many know the district attorney? Not so much. Come on. So I'm facing 20 plus years in prison. I get out to fight the charges in Albuquerque. And during that time, I was real discouraged. You know, I'm facing 20 plus years. This wasn't part of the plan that I thought God had for my life. And during that season, I went back to my old life like a dog returning to its vomit. I began, to, I began to shoot heroin again. I began to, to smoke rock cocaine. I began to sell drugs. I went on the run again. And many, many of you know this story, but I would stay at a, at a little hotel on Central Avenue called the De Anza. And right there, man, I was doing, doing so much drugs, man. I would sell dope in the alley right behind there. And you know what I mean? During that season, man, the demonic realm was opened up to me. I would have little demons running around me with voices. Voices of little children laughing at me. Stuff would move in my room. Things would show up and talk to me. Huh? I would leave my body at night and float around and, and demons would attack me. I would, be, I would be held down to my bed with demons in my face. It's called sleep paralysis, but all I knew was I couldn't move and there were demons in my face. And let me tell you something. During that season, man, I wanted to kill myself. I wanted to take my life. And man, many times I would get down on that little bed and I can see myself like I was there then. I would get down on that little bed in De Anza Hotel in Albuquerque, New Mexico and I would put a 45 Ruger to my head and I would want to blow my head off. And there was a voice in the back of my head that said, why don't you kill yourself? Your life's a waste. You don't even know your daughter. Everybody, everybody who loves you, you hurt them. You're a junkie. You're hopeless. There's no hope for you. You're going to prison and you might as well kill yourself. By the grace of God, I didn't pull that trigger and I was picked up and I was sent to prison. By the grace of God, I only got eight years and I went to prison and I was doing the same thing. You know, just discouraged, getting high, bringing in drugs, caught a heroin habit in the joint. And then I was picked up for suspicion of bringing narcotics into the facility. And I was sent over for pre-hearing detention to the prison in Santa Fe in level five. And I went over there at level five in Santa Fe. Solitary confinement. And I got down on my knees. And I said, Jesus, if you're still there, would you come back into my life? And let me tell you something, friend. It was like waves of electric liquid that flowed over me for five months. Man, my prison became a palace. Man, my dungeon was filled with light. God restored my calling. God restored the peace in my life. He raised me up for such a time as this. Let me tell you, since uh, 10 years ago when God met me in solitary confinement, I have not stuck a needle in my arm again. I have not smoked crack. Come on. I haven't had sex with anyone but my beautiful wife. She asked me to stop saying that. I better stop saying that. But, 
my life was transformed by an encounter with Jesus Christ. And I understand the grace of God. That when I had preferred everything more than him, he still took me back. God's not proud. He'll take us back after we preferred everything else in this world over him. So I don't know where you're at today. You know, you're here, to, you're here today and at one time you were living for Jesus. But you're not right now. Truth be told, you're not living for Jesus right now. And right now, let's just all bow our heads and close our eyes. And you're about to feel the arrows of God begin to flow through this house. A spirit of conviction, a spirit of repentance is falling upon you right now. It's falling upon you right now. You were living for God at one time, but just like me, you went back to your old life and now you feel like you'll never get out. But I got good news for you today that the blood of Jesus that was shed abroad when he was shed abroad on Calvary, that blood has not lost its effectiveness. Huh? 2,000 years later, the blood of Jesus is still giving sins. He's still setting people free. Or maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor... You say, you know what you're talking about? I don't know nothing about that. I heard a lot about Jesus, but I've never had an encounter with him. We're in the Bible Belt, so I know everybody heard a lot about Jesus. But I want to ask you, do you know him? Does he walk with you? Does he talk with you? And so this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to count to three. And if you meet one of those two requirements, you were walking with Jesus, but you're not right now. Or you know what? You're, you're, you're here today and you heard the message and you felt something today. And you know what? You say, I've never actually surrendered my life to Jesus. I've heard about him, but I don't know him. I'm going to count to three and then I want your hands to go up from all over this room. That's the presence. I feel the presence of God in here. It's flowing right now like waves across this room. That's God. That's God right there. One. You were walking with Jesus at one time, but you're not right now, and you want to get right. Two, you've never had an encounter with Jesus, but you say, I feel it this morning. I want to surrender to Jesus. Three, from all over this place, raise your hand. You want to get right with God this morning. You want to get right with God. I see those hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, from all over this place, this is what I want you to do. I want you to be very bold. I want you to stand up, and I want you to come put your feet up against this altar and surrender to Jesus. Let's give them a hand clap as they come forward. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come to Jesus. 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 Come on, come on. Put your feet up against this altar. Zach, pull that back. Come on, pull, just put your feet up against this altar. You want to get right with God this morning. Put your feet up against this altar. Come on, there's still room. We got a space right here waiting for someone to come forward. Come on, come forward. You want to get right with God today. Isn't this beautiful? Isn't this beautiful? We're going to begin to worship right now. I just want you guys to focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus as we worship this morning. God's got something for you this morning. Thank you for coming forward. Thank you for being bold and surrendering to Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Just say, I surrender Jesus. I surrender. Let him know. Fill me, God. Fill me, God. Rabba. Oh. God will finish the work that he started in you, Adam. He's going to finish it. Everything he spoke over your life and much more will come to pass. Shorobo, serraba, rebebebe, rabba, basoro. Hallelujah. God, thank you, God. You're married to the backslider. You're married to the backslider. Thank you, God. Shorobo. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 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 Jesus.
is tremble Hallelujah. Jesus Jesus Hallelujah. you silence me you. Jesus Jesus you make darkness tremble Jesus Jesus silence me Hallelujah. This is what I want you to do. If you answered this altar call and you're able to, if you could look at me. And this is what I want to do. Remember, it's not just about, it's not just about saying a, a, a prayer after a preacher at the altar call, but it's about the cry of your heart to the living God. He hears your prayers today. He drew you to this altar. He drew you to this church for a reason. And so I'm going to lead you in a prayer. You know what I mean? But remember, it's not just about repeating a prayer. Right? I say every Sunday, podemos hacer esto en español si queremos. We could do this in English or Spanish. It's not a formula, but it's the cry of your heart to the living God. Amen. Amen. So just repeat after me. Say, but mean it with all your heart. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I pray. Your keeping power in my life. That I won't get sidetracked. But I'll go all in for you. Give me a hunger for your word. Give me a hunger for worship. Give me a hunger for the things of your spirit. I believe you're the Son of God. You came to this earth, you were born of a virgin lived a sinless life and then died on the cross for my sin and then you resurrected and you're now at the right hand of the Father and then you poured out your spirit fill me with your spirit give me a hunger for your word give me a hunger for truth that I would know the truth and the truth would set me free in Jesus' mighty name. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, we, this is what I want you to do if you raised your hand. This may be the biggest group ever. I think 20 is the mass. So, this is what I want you to do as you follow Pastor Dave. He wants to talk with you, give you a Bible. We want to get you connected. We want to walk with you through this. You're not alone. We're with you. We believe in discipleship at this church. We want to come alongside you. So, if you came to this altar, go ahead and follow Pastor David. Zach will continue to, to help you guys go that way. Let's go ahead and worship. Just what we're going to, as they begin to leave, we're going to, as they begin to step out, we're going to continue to worship here a little bit. But what I, what I want to do is I'm going to have a few of our prayer workers that haven't gone to the back. You know what I mean? If they would come and stand at the front, maybe Tim and Heidi, Susan Smith, uh, uh, some of our other, some of our other prayer workers, you know, if you could come stand at the altar and, and help pray with people. But, he, but, he, but here's the thing. You know what I mean? I believe that God wants to break down the strongholds in our minds. The things that we have begun to believe about ourselves and about others. We need to have, we need to, we need to, to go by what the word says about our lives. Amen. So we're going to worship this. We're going to worship. And if you want prayer, we have prayer workers up here. You know what I mean? To, to go ahead and pray with you. But I just want to pray a blessing over you today. Just raise your hands and close your eyes and receive. Say the Lord, I say the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. The Lord raise you up to be a soldier in this city. The Lord, I rebuke the devourer that comes against your finances. We pray healing. We pray deliverance in your lives and in your families in the mighty name of Jesus. We'll see you Wednesday night for discipleship. If you want prayer, come forward as we worship. Let's sing this song through one time and then you may be dismissed. God bless you. What a powerful